A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and proclaimed, You who are Jews, indeed all of you staying in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to my words. You who are Israelites, hear these words. Jesus the Nazarene was a man commended to you by God with mighty deeds, wonders, and signs, which God worked through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This man delivered up by the set plan and foreknowledge of God, you killed, using lawless men to crucify him. But God raised him up, releasing him from the throes of death, because it was impossible for him to be held by it. For David says of him, I saw the Lord ever before me. With him at my right hand, I shall not be disturbed. Therefore, my heart has been glad and my tongue has exalted. My flesh, too, will dwell in hope because you will not abandon my soul to the nether world, nor will you suffer your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. My brothers, one can confidently say to you about the patriarch, David, that he died and was buried, and his tomb is in our midst to this day. Since he was a prophet and knew that God was sworn an oath to him, that he would set one of his descendants upon his throne, he foresaw and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that neither was he abandoned to the netherworld, nor did his flesh see corruption. God raised this Jesus, of this we are all witnesses. Exalted at the right hand of God, he received the promise of the Holy Spirit from the Father and poured his forth as, as you see and hear. Verbum da mini. Show me the path of life. 
the fullness of joy in your presence, at your right hand bliss forever. from the first letter of St. Peter. Beloved, if you invoke as Father him who judges impartially, according to each one's works, conduct yourselves with reverence during the time of your sojourning, realizing that you were ransomed from your futile conduct, handed on by your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, as one, a spotless, unblemished lamb. He was known before the foundation of the world, but revealed in the final time for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Verbum Domini. Sancti Evangelii secundum Lucam. Gloria That very day, the first day of the week, two of Jesus' disciples were going to a village seven miles from Jerusalem called Emmaus. And they were conversing about all the things that had occurred. And it happened that while they were conversing and debating, Jesus himself drew near and walked with them, but their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing as you walk along? They stopped, looking downcast. One of them named Cleopas said to him in reply, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know of the things that have taken place there in these days? And he replied to them, what sort of things? They said to him, the things that happened to Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, how our chief priests and rulers both handed him over to a sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that he would be the one to redeem Israel. And besides all this, it is now the third day since this took place. Some women from our group, however, have astounded us. They were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. But they came back and reported that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who announced that he was alive. 
And some of those with us went to the tomb and found things just as the women had described, but him they did not see. And he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets spoke. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them what referred to him in all the scriptures. As they approached the village to which they were going, he gave the impression that he was going on farther. But they urged him, stay with us, for it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And it happened that while he was at table with them, he took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them. With that, their eyes were opened and they recognized him, but he vanished from their sight. Then they said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he spoke to us on the way and opened the scriptures to us? So they set out at once and returned to Jerusalem where they found gathered together the 11 and those with them who were saying, the Lord has truly been raised and has appeared to Simon. And the two recounted what had taken place on the way and how he was made known to them in the breaking of bread. Verbum Domini. It was on the day, November 20th, in the year 2010, that Pope Benedict XVI created as a cardinal a man who had grown up in a remote village in Guinea, in West Africa, Robert Serra, Cardinal Robert Serra. And at the same time, he made him the president of one of the pontifical councils at the Vatican, the Pontifical Council Cor Unum. Cor Unum means one heart. And what it is, is that it is the charitable outreach of the successor of St. Peter. And Pope Benedict, before he had created him as a cardinal, had a private meeting with him and he said, I know that you know what poverty and what trouble difficulties are since you've experienced them in Guinea. And I know that you will know best how to apply the charitable means of the church in the tragic situations. And so in different, where there's war, where there's natural uh, disasters, epidemics, famines, these sorts of things, it's a way in which the church reaches out and brings the charity of Christ to these places. And as Cardinal Sarah would say in commenting on this, that often the deepest need people have is not for material things, although that is necessary, but is the need they have for God. It's often that, that God has been obscured or is absent from the hearts of men that makes the difficulty even more tragic, even more miserable. And so it's not enough just to bring that material aid. They also need to encounter the love of God. And so he was asked, what was one of the most remarkable events that took place during your four years as a president of the Pontifical Council Cor Unum? And he related that terrible tsunami that took place in Japan, March 11, 2011. And it was two months after this horrible event in which thousands of people had lost their lives and their homes and everything, that he flies there to Japan. And he found it remarkable the welcome that he received because most of the people were Buddhist. 
But they were looking, he said, not just for the material aid that he was bringing, they were looking for some hope in God from him. Despite their differences in religious beliefs, they were looking for, from him, some hope in God. And so after he distributed the material aid of the church there, in the midst of the people, and this was an event that was televised in Japan, he prayed at great length. And he had a symbolic uh, gesture where he cast these flowers into the ocean, remembering all of those that had died during that uh, tragic tsunami. And he said he looked at the orphans' eyes. They had lost their parents, and they were so sad. He looked at the men and women who were trying to rebuild their homes. He looked at the elderly people who were just exhausted with fatigue. And he realized that only God could console them, could touch their hearts, could enter into their hearts and bring them that deepest consolation that, that they needed at that time. It was two months later after he returned to the Vatican that he received a letter that he recounts in his book from a Buddhist woman in Japan. I wanted to read that letter in its entirety and uh, tie it into our gospel of today. So he wrote a, young, a, a letter from a young Buddhist woman, wrote me two months after my return from Japan, and it moved me profoundly. She told me, quote, after the terrible tsunami in which we lost many members of our family and almost all our belongings, I wanted to commit suicide. But after hearing you on television with the peace and serenity that I rediscovered while watching you pray for the survivors and for the dead, after the effect in me of your recollection and your silent prayer on the seacoast, and finally, after the moving gesture that you made by throwing flowers into the ocean in memory of all who were engulfed by the waves, I gave up the idea of killing myself. Thanks to you, I understood, and now I know, that despite this disaster, someone loves us, lives beside me, and shares my sufferings because we must certainly be of great price in his sight. This someone is God. I felt his presence and his compassion through the Holy Father, the Pope, and through you. I am not Catholic, but I write you these lines to thank you and to thank the Holy Father, Pope Benedict XVI, for this immense comfort that you have given me. I know that other persons have received, as I did, this precious spiritual aid that we all need, especially at a time of great, terrible trials. And so commenting on this letter, Cardinal Serra, that's the end of that letter, Cardinal Serra says that uh, bringing the church's charity, he says, is to help people to rediscover the presence the compassion and the merciful love of God in the midst of our sufferings. And this final paragraph that ties really to today's gospel, he said, the real relief that we must bring to the poor and to afflicted people is not just material, but spiritual. It is necessary to reveal to them the love, the compassion, and the closeness of God. God is with us in the trial. He walks with us along the road to Emmaus, the road of disappointment, suffering, and discouragement. And so in today's gospel, we hear that this stranger they do not recognize, these two disciples, and they're asked what they're talking about. And what does Luke say? They stopped looking downcast. And they go on to talk about they had had all this hope in Jesus the Nazarene. They were hoping he was going to be the one that they were waiting for. 
And they're using the words in past tense. We were hoping, like it was lost. But what happens is that Jesus opens up to them a new understanding of the scriptures. It was something that had not occurred to them, how the scriptures had foretold the sufferings that the Christ would endure, and this was fulfilled in Jesus. And in fact, he had risen from the dead. And so what did they say after they came to recognize Jesus in the breaking of the bread? Weren't our hearts burning within us? Weren't they burning in us as we came to understand something we didn't see before? And you know, in the tragedies of life, and of course, this was just a terrible tragedy to the disciples, that many abandoned the Lord, they left for fear, or they're hiding in fear, this horrible tragedy, and yet it had never occurred to them how God was working in that very event, and in some way, he was going to bring a resurrection, you know, as he does in all the tragedies of life, and somehow he's going to bring some life. I remember one of the sisters saying to me one time, remember, Father Joseph, with every cross, there's a resurrection. There was something difficult that was going on at the time. Remember, Father Joseph, with every cross, there is a resurrection. And then when we think about St. Peter, too, that he's been lifted up. He's been lifted up by understanding, too, uh, who Christ is. And he quotes in today's first reading from the Acts of the Apostles, where he is preaching, you know, after the Pentecost event. He's quote, he quotes David, so one of the Psalms. Now, if you look in your Bibles at Psalm 16, which is a psalm that was sung today, and the one that St. Peter refers to in today's first reading, it has a title, a miktan of David. There are six psalms that have that title, a miktam of David. We're not sure what miktam is. Uh, some interpret it as poem. Others think it may pertain to one of the instruments that was to be used because the psalms were something to be sung. So I'm happy we have our choir here to help us to sing this Psalm 16, which is one that Peter is pointing to specifically as being fulfilled in Jesus, that David, so this is one of the Psalms specifically attributed to David, that David foresaw, he says, David was a patriarch, but he's also a prophet. And he foresaw and he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ. And so what did we hear in this Psalm that you would you would not abandon my soul to the netherworld, nor will you suffer your faithful one to undergo corruption. You know, there was an understanding that on the fourth day, that's when the corruption began. So do you remember when Lazarus was sick and the message is brought to Jesus, but he waits. He doesn't go immediately. And in fact, when he arrives, Lazarus has been four, four days dead. And what does uh, Martha say when Jesus says, Unroll, open the tomb? There's going to be a stench. The corruption had started. Well, Jesus rose on the third day. And so what did David prophesy? You will not suffer your faithful one to undergo corruption. And then part of that psalm that we repeated, you will show me the path of life. You will show me the path of life because we too, and in fact, our prayer after Holy Communion today will refer to this, that we too will share in this incorruption of glory of Jesus. Yes, our flesh will be corrupted here on this earth, but it will be restored in glory. And so after communion, I will say this prayer. Look with kindness upon your people, O Lord, and grant, we pray, that those who are, you are pleased to renew by eternal mysteries may attain in their flesh the incorruptible glory of the resurrection. With every cross, there is a resurrection. We need to know, as Cardinal Sarah said, and as this Buddhist woman had come to discover 
that God walks with us. You know, Father Mark and I had the privilege of going to these different sites in the Holy Land this past December, and recently they aired our special that we did on the resurrection sites of our Lord. And we started at Mount Tabor, which was a prefiguration of his resurrection. And then we also went to, uh, of course, the Holy Sepulchre, the tomb where Jesus rose again from the dead. We went to the Sea of Galilee, one of the resurrection appearances of Jesus. But we also went to the spot revered of where our Lord appeared to these two disciples on the road to Emmaus. There's actually three different sites there in the Holy Land. But this one, and specifically, uh, there's a saint, Saint Mary of the Cross, I think her name is, where the Lord revealed to her that this was a site. Pope Benedict, as a cardinal, offered mass there. There's a picture depicting that. We had the privilege to offer mass there, too. But what that points to is that these are historical, real places where these events really happened, really took place. The Lord really did walk with these disciples on this journey that they were on. But we can also think of it, as we mentioned in that show, that Emmaus is really everywhere because Jesus walks with us. We're not alone. That's what this Buddhist woman discovered in the charity of the church and the prayer that was being offered there, that God is with us, that he's with us in the trials and the tragedies of life, and that makes them bearable. There's still tragedies, there's still heartaches, and yet that makes it bearable because God is with us to sustain us. And that's what the resurrection repeats over and over again during these 50 days of this Easter season, that he has conquered sin and death and evil. There's a glory that's going to be ours where every tear will be wiped away. There'll be no more mourning or crying. And it's in the very tragedies and difficulties of this life where we are learning to prove our love, to grow in love and our confidence, our surrender, and to set our eyes on the things of heaven, the things that endure forever through that incorruptible glory of the resurrection. So may the Lord console all of those who are going through difficult times, any of our viewers or listeners, if you're going through tragic or difficult, painful times, know that you are not alone, but the risen Lord walks with you to console you, to restore your hope and the promise of his joy of salvation.